All right. Well, we're really excited to be here today. Um, I'm with Scott Ertz of Plug Hits and First Looks. Uh, I'm Terry Willingham with uh, the Foundation for Community Driven Innovation, of which I'm the executive director, uh, which is the organization that runs MROC Fab Lab in Tampa near the University of South Florida and hosts Roboticon Tampa Bay every year. And we're super excited on uh, uh, the announcement of the induction of Dean Kamen into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. And as part of our month of making at AMROC Fab Lab and, and um, in you know, partnership with Roboticon, uh, we're doing a lot of different things about invention and creation. And uh, we're super excited to have the opportunity of a student interview uh, with Dean Kamen, the founder of FIRST, who's with us today. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our student our student interviewer and uh, host, and, and uh, this is Dahlia. We're really happy you're with us, Dahlia. Dahlia is a student on First Tech Challenge Team Duct Tape, and can you tell us a little bit about yourself real quick, Dahlia? Um, I have been for FIRST for more most of my life since third grade, and I'm currently in ninth. I'm on two teams, Team FTC 2845 Team Duct Tape and Team 5276 Edgar Allen Elms FRCT. Um, awesome. And I'm really excited to interview Dean Kamen today. And you've been in FIRST for a long time, right? How long? About five years. Five years. All right. And we also have with us uh, Dean Kamen. We're super excited to have you with us today, Dean. Uh, sure. And um, Dahlia is going to handle the interview with Dean, and he can introduce himself and uh, highlight all his amazing achievements. We're so honored you're here. We're so happy you're, you're uh, inducted into the Florida in Inventors Hall of Fame and what that means for uh, recognizing your achievements and particularly uh, what that means for first students in, in Florida. Um, so without further ado, we're going to let uh, you and, and, and Dahlia have the rest of the show. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, it, uh, to our viewers, enjoy the interview. So thank you for this uh, opportunity. And, and by the way, Dahlia, when you said you were involved with FIRST for a long time, I was thinking you haven't been around for a long time. But I'll assume that if you say you've been involved for five years, that's probably more than a third maybe uh, of your life. And I can tell you I've been involved in FIRST for about 30 years. And sadly, that's also uh, closer to a third of my life. So we've been involved um, in about the same way with FIRST. Um, and I'm really excited to hear that you had five years with FIRST and that you're going to stay with FIRST. And I hope it's going to help you develop the skill sets and frankly, the, uh, the vision and the courage to become a part of the STEM community as a professional in this country, because there are loads and loads of loads of problems that this world faces that will only be solvable by people that really understand technology, embrace technology, and know how to deploy it as a tool for good. So keep it up. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, definitely enjoy first. And I'm going to ask a collection of questions from Florida First teams uh, that were prepared. Uh, starting with, do you have any specific steps or steps you take to avoid and the process, I mean, sorry, the steps you take for the process of bringing new technology to the market and things you avoid? Well, I'll tell you, you always want to avoid failing. And that's the one thing I absolutely positively can't tell you how to avoid. In fact, what I tell all the kids on first teams, and I tell all my engineers here at DECA, I've got about 800 technical people. I tell everybody the same thing. If you really want to be innovative. If you want to invent something that's never been done before, you'll probably find 10 ways not to do it before you find one way that works. And you've got to get used to the idea that failure is part of trying to innovate and solve big problems. Because if those big problems have been big problems for a long time and they're still not solved, there's a reason. It's hard. Uh, but I think the important thing is, is to remind yourself that if you do things properly and responsibly, uh, an idea can fail, a experiment can fail, a project can fail without having the person fail. You might fall down seven times, but if you stand up eight, you didn't fail, you just learned a lot and you probably won't fall down or trip over the same mistake twice. So no, I can't tell you a simple, straightforward way to 
to get projects done and get them out there helping people. I can just tell you that you make failure something that you can deal with. You make it part of the process. You move on and eventually all those failures go away instantly when you see the success and the smile on somebody's face when you give them a solution to a medical problem or some of the other kinds of projects we work on. Oh, that's actually really sweet and a good way to describe inventing. Um, the next one is, what is like the craziest idea that you've come up with that you didn't think would work but ended up working or close to working in the end? Well, you see, the problem is they all only seem crazy when they're not working. But as soon as the crazy idea becomes one that works, everybody sits around saying, oh, that's so obvious. I should have thought of that, which I've decided now is the highest compliment you can get from people. Oh, that's obvious. I could have thought of that. And our answer is always the same. Well, maybe you could have thought of it, but we did think of it. So I can't describe any of the crazy ideas that succeeded, because once they succeed, they're not crazy. Um, I can tell you that we've worked for many, many years on many, many projects that haven't yet succeeded. And so some of the things we've tried to implement in them have, we've determined would have been crazy. When we started making our prosthetic arms, we decided we couldn't carry enough energy in batteries. So we would use um, chemical energy or literally have little devices that would explode and put energy into cylinders uh, by you know, expanding gases or, or other thermodynamic processes or fuel cells. Um, we quickly gave up on the idea that you could package that stuff safely. Um, we worked on some some ideas that we tried to bring a technology to a product or to a product area that we thought could really improve it um, and found that it was, at least with current technology, unrealistic or it would be decades away. Right now, I'm working with a couple of folks to build practical electric flying machines. 10 years ago, everybody thought that was crazy. Now everybody involved in aviation thinks that's the future, just like everybody now believes electric cars will be the future. Um, we are working on ways to deliver all sorts of pharmaceuticals directly into people with patches they wear that are computer controlled and can communicate through the, the, the web to give real time surveillance and control and monitoring, again, in a way that years ago people would have thought was crazy. We're uh, now in the midst of a clinical trial by which we're doing hemodialysis for patients whose kidneys don't work. We built a machine that can give them the, cap the capability to dialyze themselves, not in these big centers where they all go now, but at home in their bedroom at night while they sleep and they can clean their blood. But one of the things that you need in a dialysis center is access to sterile water. Hundreds of gallons of it have to flush through these machines, which isn't a problem in a hospital, but you can't use your tap water at home. So how are you gonna power up the machine? You can get electricity. Where is it gonna get all the water it needs? So we made another device that will turn tap water into medical grade water. We were told that would be crazy and it would never work. I'm happy to tell you it's no longer crazy and it's working very well. And we have some in people's homes right now doing uh, testing. Um, we were told it would be crazy that a disabled person could be at eye level with their peers that could, that could climb a set of stairs in a balancing device. Our iBot does that and we're delivering them now, particularly to veterans that have, in many cases, literally given their legs for this country. And then they're told, well, we'll give you a wheelchair. A wheelchair confines you. I mean, you can't even go up a curb, never mind stairs, and you can't look people in the eye. You're sitting all the time. So we made our iBot, 
we were told we were nuts. And now everybody I know of that that's gotten an iBot will tell you it's changed their lives and they'll never give them up. We're very proud of that technology. So we, we work on a lot of things that people tell us it was crazy when we started. Sadly, most of the time they're right. But every once in a while, whether it's an iBot or a dialysis machine or a wearable patch pump, every once in a while, one of our crazy ideas turns out to be something that will make a big improvement in, in people's lives. So it sounds like, um, I guess, your idea should be crazy to work. And for the next question, how does an inventor, like young or old, protect the, the idea that they've created if it, and also allow people to collaborate and work on it? That's a very good question because you made it a, a subtle but difficult question by saying, how do you protect it, but allow for collaboration? You can protect it by keeping it a secret, but it doesn't do you any good as a secret. You got to get it out there. And typically, as you pointed out, you need to collaborate and get people to help you. That's why we have the patent system in this country. And it basically was put there right from the beginning by our founding fathers, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. The United States Constitution says that Congress shall protect and, and to, to deliver exclusive rights to their inventions, uh, to inventors for a limited time, because we want patents to expire so then the next generation gets to use it all. But to encourage people to invent, take the risks of their time and their money and their reputation and having people call you crazy, there has to be an incentive. And the government created the incentive by saying to an inventor, if you work on this, if you create this, and to your point, most importantly, you're willing to share it with the world, you put it down in a patent. And if we review that patent and we determine that it's never been done before, it's novel, and that you fully explained it, because that's the price you pay to get the government's protection. You have to explain to the world how you did it, but they can't use it without your permission for a limited time until the patent expires. Um, the patent system was put there to answer the question that you asked, how do you both create and protect an idea, but allow people to collaborate with you to get it out there? And the answer is you file and get a patent, and then you can work with people to build it up, but still protect the fact that it's your property. Sounds really interesting, and I will definitely keep that in mind. Uh, for the next question, uh, for the projects that you've made and have worked, have you, I mean, as the projects that, like, have you ever, I'm sorry, have you ever canceled a project or like, and how do you determine if you cancel a project? That That's another really, really great question. Uh, and yes, sadly, we have canceled projects. But your question to me is one of the toughest questions I deal with all the time, which is, have we now learned enough about this problem? Have we now seen enough failures that it's time to just look in the mirror and say, there's not enough technology yet to solve it, or we're not smart enough yet to solve it. We've tried. It's time to move on. Is it? When does that date come? Because I sit around sometimes when I see projects that are becoming more and more difficult and more frustrating and more expensive. And you go to bed every night thinking about that project, thinking one of two things. If I stay with this project after everything I've learned and all the failures, I'm being stubborn and stupid and I'm not learning from my mistakes and I should be going on to other things where I can make something succeed and help people. And you're just being just blind to reality. You stop learning, you're stubborn and you're stupid. The flip side is, wait a minute, you started on this project because it was such a big, difficult, important problem to solve. And now you're a wimpy coward. You're giving up too soon. Where is your courage? Where is your, how can you give up now? You've learned so much, you're going to get it. And you sit there and you try to decide, am I going when I shouldn't be going because I'm just too stubborn? Or am I quitting too soon because 
I've just lost courage and confidence and vision. And sometimes you keep going and suddenly it works and you realize it's important not to give up. And sometimes you work on it more and more and more until you finally do quit and you realize you should have quit a long time ago. You could have saved a lot of frustration and a lot of time and a lot of money. So once again, you asked a great question, but I don't have a great answer. It's one of those questions that, that I ask myself on almost every project. When, if ever, is it time to admit you probably ought to move on, even before you have a solution? It takes a lot of judgment, and I don't have a simple answer for you there. Thanks for your honesty. And the next question is, when you were first starting your career in inventing, were you ever worried that one of your inventions wouldn't work out? Or like, again, was what you were saying earlier? So it's funny that you asked, was I ever afraid an invention wouldn't work out? I'm afraid on every project it could end up that way. As I said, I'm used to failing. I fail a lot. I think most inventors, if they're being honest with themselves and the world would say they fail a lot. What I think is the most common thing I've seen about most successful inventors or entrepreneurs is that they just keep working. They're, they may not be the smartest people in the world. I'm certainly not. They may not be the most well-educated people in the world. I'm certainly not. But the most common characteristic of people I see that are inventing is they just stay focused and they work harder than everybody else is typically willing to do. And eventually they therefore sometimes succeed. But I have a fun story on were you worried about an invention not working? And that is the very first product that got to scale for me was a, a medical device I built when my older brother was still in med school. And I was a little older than you, but I was still in high school. And he would come home from med school and he was specializing in pediatric oncology, taking care of very sick babies, babies with cancer. My brother's a special guy, but he didn't have a way to give them some of the drugs he was developing because these babies only weigh a few pounds and standard equipment can't handle those tiny, tiny amounts. So I would go into my parents' basement and build them devices that would take precision little syringes and electronically drive them to, to deliver the drugs the way he wanted. And it turned out that as he showed it to professors in med schools where he was and other people, they got so excited, I started making more and more of them and it ended up being a business and it became enough of a business that I couldn't both keep going to college and give that the attention it need and build this business. So I ended up going home and telling my parents I was gonna, at least for a while, stop going to college. And my mother, who's a teacher and you know, believes in education, was so disappointed or upset or worried about me that she pretty much stopped talking to me. And so I remember that phrase everybody uses that say, necessity is the mother of invention. You probably heard that. It's a common phrase. Necessity is the mother of invention. But after she stopped talking to me, I realized my inventions better work or she'd not talk to me anymore. So to me, it wasn't any more that necessity, my brother's need was the mother of invention. My need to get my mom smiling again was, it was mother is the necessity of invention. I had to make that invention work and I had to make that little business succeed so my parents could calm down. And fortunately it did work and it became a very successful product and a very successful company. Well, that sounds really interesting. Um, for your next question is, what's your favorite kind of design or engineering challenges that you face? I would say we like to work on very broad-based projects that involve maybe applying some fundamental law of physics in a way that it hasn't been typically used. 
you know, some companies are really good at writing software. They're, they're software companies. And there are some companies that are really good at making mechanical things. Some companies make electronic things. When you look at what my company does, we build sophisticated systems that have hardware and software and mechanics and electronics and sensors. I mean, look at the iBot gyroscopes and accelerometers and big transmissions that carry 300 pound people around and computers that control the balance. Um, I would say we like to start with a clean piece of paper, some fundamental physics and say, why can't we approach this old problem in a new way with new technology and get a much better result? And typically we work on big systems oriented projects like that, which is why I have so many different kinds of engineers in my company. Uh, I mean, that sounds like good challenges to work on. And now more related to FLL and first, how did you, how did you form first? Like, how was it born? Well, as I said, we like to start with a clean piece of paper, look at old problems in new ways. And I think first is no more or no less of an invention than any of my other uh, uh, obsessions. Uh, in the case of first, I said, let's look at an old problem. Uh, fewer and fewer people, at least in my lifetime, are really studying math and science and engineering and becoming inventors, particularly like yourself, most young women and and minorities in this country uh, are so disproportionately underrepresented in the world of tech. I said, this is a problem for the country and it's a problem that's been getting worse and worse. And so many young people think the only exciting careers are in the NBA or the NFL or in Hollywood and the world of sports and the world of entertainment dominates the culture, particularly again, uh, among women and minorities. And I said, that's not surprising when you look at the way our culture makes fun of smart young kids, girls in particular, are nerdy with the thick glasses if they like math and science. And guys that are really good at math and science are, again, always the butt of stereotype jokes. And I said, no wonder uh, we see this happening. And as an inventor, as I said before, you look at old problems in new ways. I said, instead of trying to add more and more on the education side and complaining that we have an education crisis, which many people believe when I started first and still believe, I said, we don't have an education crisis. We've got the bi biggest education budget in the world. We have great schools and great teachers and great resources. It's not what we don't have enough of education. It's, it's what we have too much of distractions compared to the rest of the world that's figured out kids ought to work hard at becoming really, really technically smart. So I said, in our country, kids just want to work really hard at you know, getting that varsity letter. And I said, well, in our free country and a free culture where you get the best of what you celebrate, and we know that kids are passionate about sports and entertainment, why don't we figure out how to get kids to celebrate successes in science and technology and engineering and inventing? And why don't we put it in, in a format that we know works for kids, sports. And we'll do it as an aspirational after school activity. And unlike in the classroom where the teachers have to give them quizzes and tests and finals and give them red X's and be judgmental, but that same teacher after school is not only allowed, they're supposed to go from teacher, judgmental, to coach, nurturing. And the coach at the after school sport doesn't have to give quizzes and tests and finals. No, the coaches tell the kids, you know, bring the mascots and the school band and the cheerleaders and let's work together at getting better at, at this or that. And let's not have final exams. Let's have a tournament and let's have a championship. And so I invented first around the model of things that we know works to get kids passion and attention, sports and entertainment. And I focused on solving the problem of particularly getting women and minorities to feel that engineering and science and mathematics is every bit as much fun and every bit as accessible and way more likely to 
end up giving them opportunities to have great careers based on those skills than anything else they can do. Very few kids are ever going to get so good at bouncing a ball, they'll have one of a dozen jobs at the NBA. But millions of kids are developing the skill sets through FIRST that will allow them to go after the millions of career opportunities in the world of tech. So I started FIRST, I believe, as a in the same way we do other projects, look at an old problem, look at a new way to approach it and build a system, test it, and if it works, scale it up. And we've now scaled up first, as I think you know, to be in many tens of thousands of schools, and it's impacted hundreds of thousands of kids. And we have hundreds of thousands of mentors and thousands of sponsors, and we give away millions of dollars in scholarships to the universities that participate. And it's become, I think, a very, very effective tool for industry to start creating a, a next generation of pipeline of people they need in their companies. Uh, and I think everybody involved in FIRST loves it, which is why it keeps growing. The teachers love it. It inspires the kids to work hard. The corporate sponsors love it because the kids start focusing on the skill sets that these companies are going to need. Uh, I think the mentors love it because uh, they get into a fun environment with, with their skill sets and get to show kids what's possible. So the kids, the parents, the teachers, the mentors, the sponsors, the government people, everybody loves FIRST because they all work hard at it, but they all get more out of it than what they put into it. And I hope you're one of those people. You know, we're... <laughs> We're, we're fortunate in our circle that, you know, so many of our people have been affected by FIRST in all the ways that you just mentioned, from, from the students to mentors and coaches and sponsors and all of that. And uh, so I know on behalf of everybody, I've, from, from my generation, we appreciate it. Uh, and now we are now alumni, you know, out in the world, you know, running software companies. We've got, we've got a coach that's an alumni that's working at Lockheed Martin. And, uh, you know, a lot of us were directly affected, uh, by, by that. And the, the good news is, uh, we, we, I, we, we have to wrap because I know you've got a hard stop. Uh, but the good news is that you're going to be back with us, uh, next week where we're going to talk about life after first, we're going to talk, uh, and it's going to be alumni getting to uh getting to discuss that so we appreciate you coming back and doing that maybe we can uh get together and go through some more of the the florida uh team questions because all of these questions and i love that all the questions came from teams here in florida so um i know i know for today though uh i want to thank you for taking the time uh to to speak with with dahlia and uh once again i'd like to congratulate you for your your uh, induction into the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for the support at first. And Dahlia, thank you for giving me so many substantive and intelligent questions. I hope I was able to give you at least some reasonable answers. But I thank you for being involved. And I hope you'll stay more and more involved with FIRST uh, for a very long time. So uh, I will be back in touch with all of you guys soon. Be safe. You too. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.